G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication. Gamtel G Fiber, now you can enjoy super fast internet in gigabytes. G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication. of owning your dream homes. EJ Investment is here for you. Secure our quality bungalows with two, three, or four bedrooms or our story building three or four to five bedrooms at very affordable prices with flexible payment plans at our Sanyang Sea View Estate where you can enjoy the cool breeze with modern infrastructure such as the roads, covered drainage system, modern electrification with street lights, gated entrance with security posts, and social amenities such as gas station, shopping mall, medical clinic, park, schools, children daycare, and a lot more. Our dedicated team of professionals will keep the estate clean at all times, provide security and patrol team within the estate premises, install latest technologies such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, home network installation, solar panel, and power backup system. Also, check out for our additional home facilities and interior design service, such as premium tiling, wall plaster, home landscape, fingerprint home lock, and a lot more. Visit our office at Senegambia Kololi Highway and get a free site visit tour or contact us on 4464-838. WhatsApp us on 32592200. Or you can visit our Facebook page or Instagram on EJ Investments. EJ Investments, we are first in properties. We live in a day and age where technology is creating a world without borders, filled with unlimited potential to improve the lives of the people around us. Innovarex Global Health ushers in a new way of leveling the playing field with increased access to quality healthcare services delivered at your doorstep. It is indeed an honor to have you here. So without wasting much time, I will just allow the party leader to come in and deliver his speech. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it, it's, 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 it is necessary that we have face masks on, but it's muffling my speech, so I will, since I'm reasonably good distance away from everyone, um, in the interest of being properly heard, I'm going to remove it and uh, do that. First, I want to welcome. I want to welcome all of you to the GMC National Secretariat here on Kairaba Avenue, along Pipeline Road. Once again, I am very delighted to welcome you. The purpose of today is essentially to to deliver a press briefing, in other words, to make a statement and allow you to make sense out of it. However, we have decided to change the format 
I will issue a preliminary statement and subsequently we will allow you to ask some questions and uh, we will end up right there. It is not a full full scale question and answer session. Uh, there are specific concerns. The nation is extremely concerned. We are in a very volatile situation. It is absolutely necessary that the people of this country are able to hear from their leaders in order to provide a strategic direction as to where we should be leading to in this state of apparent uncertainty. Now, fellow Gambians, our nation is at a crossroad. Over the past three years and some months, I have addressed you on a number of key concerns impacting governance, the economy, and our society. Today we shall focus exclusively on national security and law and order. When I joined the coalition cabinet on the 1st February 2017, the most critical issue facing the country was security. How do we establish the authority of the new government? Pacify areas of the country that sought to threaten national security, destabilize peace, and take the law into their own hands. Against the need to protect human dignity and fundamental rights. Communities that exhibited the greatest human, the greatest resistance to the new order experience concentrated presence of law enforcement assets with a view to imposing the legitimate authority of the new administration consistent with the electoral dictates of the Gambian voters. It was not an easy task as some communities felt unfairly targeted for political reasons, wrongly. Our duty was to ensure that every inch of Gambian soil was subject to Gambian law. And no part of the country in every community would be permitted to be an outlaw. I directed all necessary measures to be implemented, ensuring that citizens obey the law at all costs, and that lawbreakers were to be subjected to the full force of the law. We empowered internal security apparatus, such as the Gambia Police Force, the Gambia Immigration Department, the Department of the uh, Drug Law Enforcement Agency of the Gambia, to exercise their mandate and putting the Gambia Police Force as the lead institution among all law enforcement agencies in the protection of public security. Working with the President's Office and Cabinet, we restored the statutory authority of the Gambia Police Force, withdrew the armed forces from all civilian areas, and returned them back to the barracks where they belong. We sought to reorganize the NIA and confine its role to its true mandate as an intelligence institution and not an instrument of brutality. We began the process of reforming internal security institutions, starting with security sector reform. During my tenure, we launched this process with the appointment of the National Security Advisor for the first time in the history of the Gambia, tasked with the coordination of the reform agenda. A multidisciplinary task force was established to work on the first National Security Assessment Report and I made sure as minister that the task force was housed under my office at the Minister of Interior for closer supervision and coordination. Supported by the United Nations and the European Union, the first National Security Assessment Report was produced, validated, and served as the foundation document for the National Security Policy and National Security Strategy document. I worked with my senior management team to create the Minister of Interior Strategy Plan 2017-2020, which addressed the threats and potential threats facing the, com the country. The strategy focused on five goals, and it was a culmination of the collective wisdom of the ministry and its stakeholders. 
since I left the ministry on the 10th November 2017, the strategy plan 2017-2020 of the Ministry of Interior designed to create a new proactive internal security infrastructure was abandoned. The five strategy goals I created for the ministry were one, strengthening public order and security and reducing insurg insurgent activity. Number two, enforcement of the rule of law, reducing crimes to combating narcotics and corruption. Number three, strengthening strategic management and communication systems through institutional development, diversity, and structural reforms. Number four, improving professionalism, provision of quality security services to the public, and strengthening public trust in law enforcement. And number five, improving the quality and effectiveness of infrastructure, resources, and support services to the Ministry of Interior. Today, crime is on the rise. The highest sense of confidence, high morale, and institutional empowerment I had injected in the Gambia Police Force and other satellite institutions have been eroded. The ability of the Gambia Police Force and other internal security outfits to combat crime, especially violent crime, has been emasculated, circumscribed by many factors, including inadequate logistical support, Inadequate motivation, inadequate motivation drive partly due to low new remuneration and corruption, low level of education among the rank and file, low level public trust in the police force, capacity and resource constraints, etc., etc., among others. Today, the country is outraged. The country is outraged not only at the inability the apparent inability of law enforcement institutions to protect the public. Crime in the street is very high. The number of criminals that the country produces, both in country and out country, is on the rise. Cross-border incursions, robbery, many parts of our borders, including murder, including uh, theft, rape, and other violent, of violent offenses are on the rise in the country. It appears the Gambia police force or the Gambia government is not capable of protecting the public. The general sense of hysteria, the general sense of fear across the country is very evident. Everywhere you go, the bus work for the public today is insecurity. People are unsafe. They are unsafe at home, they are unsafe in their workplaces, and they are unsafe in the streets. The primary function of every government is to protect your citizens, is to provide a sense of certainty and security so that national development, commerce and trade, and all the aspects that are essential for the life of a country can continue to thrive. When there is breakdown of law and order, which is usually reflected in high crime rate, particularly violent crime, in instability among communities, in a feeling of not being secure, secure in the person, secure in your property, secure in your communities, this is the first signal towards a failed state. When a state fails to protect its people, it leads to a breakdown of law and order. When law enforcement institutions continue to intensify the purpose of their existence, then it is the introduction of a gradual anarchy and chaos which erodes the democratic foundation of any society. And that is where we are leading towards. And this is why it is necessary that leaders or people who project themselves as leaders must come forward in order to assure a jittery nation. Today, we all witnessed some of the inadequacies that are reflected by our law enforcement agencies. We thought never again that this country will, will witness some of the unfortunate incidents that we witness today in a new democracy we call New Gambia. But suddenly we have to look at the circumstances. As a former security minister, I am very much aware of the circumstances of where we are today. 
as a former security minister, I understand the challenges that the security establishment confronts in this country. And as a former security minister, I sat down and witnessed firsthand by experience there's so many men and women who don our uniforms, who are great Gambians, who are patriots, who love this country, and who go day in and out, protecting the public, looking after public welfare, ensuring that those of us can go about our business peacefully. So I want to ask you all Gambians today, that in this confusion that we witness, in this uncertainty that we live, in this anger and outrage that we are all talking about, the circumstances and the facts which are still new and the wounds which have not yet healed, we must understand that we cannot use one yardstick against everybody. I am not here as a spokesperson of the Gambia Police Force, but I understand the institutional challenges that they face. We must not, as a country, turn enemy to law enforcement. We must not, as a country, punish the entire law enforcement agencies with the stick of one individual, or one agency, or one unit of an agency. We must understand that law enforcement agencies conduct tremendous sacrifice on our behalf for little pay, for less appreciation. And I want to assure Gambians that we ought to be proud of some of the people who wear our uniform, the men and women of the Gambia, every day who sacrifice to keep us safe, to make sure that we can go to bed with a sound sleep, and some of the challenges that they face, I know, that I inherited, that I try to fight and I try to change, still exist within law enforcement. Some of the lowest paid people in this country, in the entire public sector, you will find them are in the prison service. They are less paid. Some of them are earning $1,800 a month, $1,500 is a month. What can you do with that? You go to the Gambia police force, they are battling with serious issues. These are people who are lowest paid, even uniform becomes a problem. These are people who have difficulties working under extreme circumstances. And I'm going to give you typical examples, some of the issues that the Gambia Police Force and other law enforcement confront. So the failure, the failure of the security system is an indictment on the general capacity of the Gambia to provide what is necessary in terms of resources and in terms of tools to protect this country. I know because I sat down on the seat and I saw the inefficiencies and the deficiencies that this nation failed to provide to the men and women in uniform to protect our society. So today, as we, as we all of us express our disgust at what we saw at one of the sub-institutions of the Gambia Police Force, we must also understand that that does not represent who we are as a people. And it does not represent who the security institutions are all about. First and foremost, we are talking about crime in this country. And the rise in crime is a consequence of the poverty and the unemployment and the deprioritization of the capacity that this country ought to generate for more employment, for employment opportunities for our young people. We graduate every year thousands of young people. And as they graduate, the country is not ready to transition them from school to after school life. There are no opportunities for young people. There are no jobs for them. There are no proper skill development centers for them. There are no opportunity creation for them. And the provisional chances are nil. What do we expect these hundreds and thousands of young people who graduate every year from school and there is nothing ready for them? They must build a future. They have needs, they have aspirations. At the end of the day, the Gambia is becoming a huge crime incubation center because of the inability of policymakers to create and to build a future for our young people in this country. This has been the trend for over half a century since independence. We continue to create a failure mill, dynasty of the poor, in other words, the poor producing poor children, creating a dynasty of the poor in this country. That is what we are good at. In other words, we are producing a failure mill where young people are poorly educated, poorly skilled, with no after-school experience or opportunities to better themselves, crime becomes the attractive industry. So today, the response to crime is not violent crime from law enforcement. The response to crime is not another effective crime management, of course. 
but the response to crime is building an economy and a political system that is capable of responding to the needs of young people so that we can create better jobs for them, we can build opportunities, and they can feel part of that inclusive development. That is the hope of every Gambian. This is the solution to dealing with crime. As much as you look at the crime statistics, the majority of people involved in crime are young people between the ages of 16 and sometimes from 14 to 35. And this is the most important democracy in our country. But this is the democracy that is wasting away because we have governments that do not care about the future of our country. And this is the trajectory that must change if this country is to have the sustainable future. But law enforcement will continue to rise up to the challenge, commensurate to the emergence of the new crime, which is reflected in white collar crimes, in the innovative and creative ways in which criminals and criminal syndicates seem to be above the cuff. And that is why the Minister of Interior, together with other institutions dealing with security, must be able to emerge with strategies in order to confront these new security threats that our country faces. But how can we do this? Development is impossible if we don't have security. Development is impossible if there's no stability. Development is impossible if we do not have peace. But we rely on institutions to provide this for us. Notably, the Minister of Interior, including other sister organizations, so that we can have a nurturing environment that will get this country on a path of sustainable growth, wealth creation, and of course, all of the other indices that the government was working on, and all of us must be concerned about. But the police force, which during my time, we did so much to bring at the fore of internal security, of domestic security, so that they will become the vanguard in ensuring public security and public safety. And we put the army backwards, but correspondingly, this nation has not rise up in order to be fair to its law enforcement institutions. Only recently that most police, most police in this country have more than one boots. Most have more than one uniform. For years, they deal with only one, particularly those in traffic. You pass them, the sun is so hot, even their collars get turned. And they are sweating because of sweat. And they smell because of the sweat. The hot burning sun. The police cannot communicate. How do we combat crime when it is impossible for the police to communicate among themselves? When they, they lack communication gadgets. When crime is committed in Banjul and the criminal escaped the police and is on the way to Serekunda or Bakao or the Congos, this criminal will evade Denton Bridge because the police have very limited means of communicating to their, uh, to their officers on Denton Bridge. We do not have what is, what is conventionally called a walkie-talkie communication system. We've seen it in other countries. Is this country serious about fighting crime? You go to police stations, there are no computers. There are only files, paper files. How many police are connected to the internet? Police stations are connected to the internet. How many police stations are real police stations in this country? Now, if you go around the country, how many police stations are actually owned by the Gambia government? 90% of them are rented in buildings and properties that are very unsafe themselves. How many police, police vehicles do we have in this country? When you report a crime to the police force, they are not able to respond because they don't have the mobility, they don't have the logistics, they don't have the ability to respond to community requests because the police are underfunded. There are no vehicles. They are not able to patrol because they do not have vehicles. And the amount of money that is allocated to police stations that have vehicles is only 2.5 liters a day. What can 2.5 liters do for a police vehicle that should patrol a community? 2.5 liters a day for a police vehicle to police a community. This is the amount of money that is budgeted for them. How do we expect empowerment? How can we save our communities? When the government places deprioritization, low, 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 when the government places low premium and no, low value on public security. What is the reorientation, the training of the Gambia police force? You talk about protecting our borders. Our borders are porous. Criminals are coming in. We know that armed robbery along Gambia's frontiers, both south and north, arrive. People are killed. People experience grievous body, body harm. Properties are carted away into, the, uh, into, the, uh, into our neighboring countries. The police are not able to respond adequately to protect our people. The immigration department is not able to provide supplementary service to the police force. 
because the logistics is not there. The training is not there. The capacity is not there. The motivation is not there. And we talk about the inability of the police to protect our people. We are not giving them the resources. Let us be fair to our country. If the country does not give the resources to the police to protect our societies, where are they going to get it from? From the sky? From the air? It is the country that must give them the resources, the budget that they need. We must de-emphasize political programs and invest in areas that will save this country. We must invest in productive sectors. But we must also value sectors that are necessary for the survival and viability of the Gambia. And the security sector is number one. And that is why when I was appointed minister, my first priority was security sector reform. And what I did was to ensure we have a panel of multidisciplinary team that conduct first and foremost the national security assessment report for the first time in the history of the country so that we know what is there, we know what is missing, and we know what we need to have. When we validated the national security assessment report nationwide for the country, we enlisted the support of the United Nations and the European Union to help fund the security sector reform, which was launched during my time as Minister of Interior. The purpose of this is to reform, nothing but to reform, reform, reorient, re-equip the law enforcement institution, particularly domestic security. Unfortunately, when I left the ministry, without beating my own trumpet, these strategies and these plans all went in abeyance. And then we returned back to government again to continue where we left from. When I returned as special advisor to the president, that was the time we finished drafting the national security document. For the first time in the history of this country, we created a national security document and began drafting national security strategy document, two key important documents necessary to look holistically look at the security infrastructure of this country. What is wrong? How do we remedy it? And what is the future of security of the Gambia? And then I left the office of the president. Security sector is almost dead. We are talking about too many things. But it is necessary that we focus on the reform agenda. But because we abandoned the reform agenda, and new ideas came in terms of self-entrainment and perpetuation, the country is going adrift. And this, may bring down, this brings me down to the purpose of the anti-crime department. This is one of the most effective, one of the most effective branches of the Gamba police force. The anti-crime department is good news for the Gambia. And I differ with all those who are calling for the scrapping of the anti-crime department. Every country, every country needs an anti-crime department. It is called different names. But it is a useful department. It is a functional and effective department that must exist in any country that cares about violent crime in particular. So, the call for it to be scrapped is wrong, is improper, and the foundation is also unjustifiable. What we need to do is to streamline its functions and make sure it is people by persons of integrity who will respect the law and also strike a balance between protection of the public and the protection of fundamental liberties of the public. It is this delicate balance that we must seek. But we must not say because the crimes of one individual or a few individuals against the public is a justification for closing down a vital department that is keeping in the main public safety and public security would be a wrong choice. So today, against advice, I stand very firmly in support of maintaining the anti-crime department. I stand very firmly in supporting the mandate of the anti-crime department. I stand very firmly in supporting additional funding and capacity training for anti-crime department. For if I had remained Minister of Interior, it was going to be my greatest weapon, my greatest weapon of crime reduction and ensuring that violent criminals who belong to jail are locked up for good. And, people, and our streets are safe, our homes are safe, and properties are safe. So the anti-crime is a great vision, and it is a great instrument in the hands of any democratic government, particularly a police force that, that is necessary for a democratic dispensation. Of course, like all institutions, they have their deficiencies. And I stand here to condemn all the violations of the law and all the repressive tendencies that were exhibited by people who work under the anti-crime department. I am not going to be able to justify those actions. I think it is reprehensible, it is condemnable that the people who are employed by this country to protect the public 
ended up becoming the abusers of the public, the oppressors of the public. It is not acceptable. But yet, we must not brush everybody with the same paint. We have an investigation into the issue of Ibrahim Asane. An independent investigation is going to be ascertained. The National Human Rights Commission has taken upon itself the duty to look at the facts and come up with the facts. The officer concerned has been put on administrative leave. The victim is going through medical treatment. As a democratic society, can we allow, can we allow due process to take its place? Can we all wait now for the conclusion of the investigation, particularly the independent investigation that is going on by the National Human Rights Commission? But meanwhile, it will be wrong and improper to jump to conclusions and determine that the entire police force is the enemy of the public. We must be grateful to the many, the thousands, the thousands of men and women who are in the police force every day who are doing their best. We have all witnessed a young woman, Kadijaju, who was sitting in the, standing in the rain without proper shoes in the middle of a flood directing traffic. And I can assure you there are many hundreds of Kadijajus in the Gambia police force. Many of them in the Gambia prison service. Many of them in the immigration department. Many of them in the drug law enforcement agencies who are, par par parading, who are patrolling our, uh, our borders, fighting against powerful crime syndicates at the risk of their life with less pay. So today I come out for the nation to express its appreciation to those who are serving us. We must understand that law enforcement are not our enemies. But where there are shortcomings, we must come out plainly and condemn those shortcomings. We must not allow, again, in the history of this country, operation by law enforcement against ordinary citizens. Violations of the law, particularly fundamental rights of the people, must be challenged at every angle and must not be condoned. But we must do, give praise where praise is owed. We must give due where due is also required. And that is to say that the bulk of our law enforcement agencies are decent people. So it troubles me when this incident, with all due respect, is over-exaggerated to cover the entire law enforcement agencies as if everybody is a criminal. This would be wrong. What is the way forward, Knight? What is the way forward? The way forward is for the police command, the Minister of Interior, to critically look at the composition and the structure of the anti-crime department and, and empower it with all the resources necessary so that it can do its job in a professional manner, in accordance with the law, in compliance with the constitution of this country. Whoever is arrested must have his due process rights respected. And whoever is affected must be treated in accordance with the law. But you must understand that these are men and women also who face dangerous criminals every day. How many people in this country have clapped for the anti-crime department because they have found your lost property? because they have convicted a criminal who attacked you, because your mobile phone was lost and you went there and they gave you your mobile phone, because they, they attacked your shop and they stole your goods and your goods were found at their store and you took your goods back again. We have too many satisfied people in this country. So in the performance of their duties, if mishap happens, we must understand and treat it objectively. I am not defending the, 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 the indefensible. And I am not saying what happened to Ibrahim Asane and people like Ibrahim Asane was right. But I am saying that it would be wrong to castigate an entire police force for the actions of a few people and a department. What we require now is reforming that department, putting in men and women of integrity who will serve the public good and put the public first and public welfare first. That is what is required now. The vision that created the department, I'm very much aware of it. This vision ought to stay. And I want to thank the police command for all that they are doing with very limited resources at their disposal. I call on the Gambia government to increase the allowances and the benefits and to further resource the Gambia police force and other law enforcement agencies. The salaries are poor. You do not expect a police officer, a traffic police officer, to earn less than $2,000 a day, and you put them on the beat in the street. You put him on the beat in the, in the street, ensuring that he is able to protect people who are supposed to be protected, and, and yet you expect him to do it effectively uh, without any qualms. You pay a police officer less than $2,000, 
stays on him at the police station and he is confronted with millions of dollars all the time. He's confronted with he's confronted with so many inducements. You bring in police graduates who are not fully prepared to confront the public on public safety issues. These are some of the challenges that they face. We all know how tough it is in this country. A bag of rice costs over a thousand dollars. You are paid thousand five hundred. You need to go to work from your home to your office every day, to police stations. How much are you going to spend on your fare? You have kids who need to go to school. You have a wife and you have other extended family responsibilities. We are encouraging law enforcement, corruption within law enforcement agencies. And when they are corrupt, instead of looking at the deficiencies of our society and what we are not giving them, we paint everybody with, a, with the same brush. So let us look inwards. Yes, we condemn corruption. Yes, I condemn incompetence and inefficiency everywhere in public service. But are we fair to law enforcement? Are we fair to our public servants? Is the country doing what it should normally to protect itself and to protect our communities? We have been talking about this. And when I was minister, I stood before the National Assembly in April uh, 2017. These are some of the highlights I put before parliamentarians. And we created a budget to ensure that we can, increase, we can maximize the condition service of our law enforcement agencies. But it is not a priority. But we've just passed 2.5 billion supplementary, uh, supplementary allocation, supplementary bill in the National Assembly. Most of it, 80% of it, political programs. The priorities of this country will continue to elude us as long as we don't put the nation first. As long as we don't put priority sectors first. As long as we put politics before national interest first. This is what you have. A society that is insecure. A law enforcement agency that is not ready to face the security challenges of the 21st century. A nation that is stuttering on the, on the brink of a failed state. That is what you get when you have wrong priorities and the wrong people, square pegs in round holes. So we must be serious as a country. How, far do, how, how long do we have to endure this? How much further must we continue on this trajectory? This is the challenge. And we have an opportunity to change this narrative practically with, with empirical circumstances in 2021. Are we moving towards it? How prepared are we to reform? How serious are we about strengthening our institutions? How committed are we to our own welfare? How serious we are as citizens to change our own circumstances? For how long are we going to complain? For how long are we going to identify the wrongs without us prescribing the rights? And where we prescribe the rights, enforcing the prescription of those rights through implementation. This has been the challenge of this country for the past five decades plus. But we have an opportunity now, we have a chance to change, and change for the better. Because the first change we have thought we can put into effect, we are still experimenting the change. And that is why today it is important for us to come out and talk about public security. But the inadequacies, the inefficiencies, the institutional uh, loopholes that exist within law enforcement, so that we can look at it as a society, put pressure on policymakers to make sure it happens. And someone will say, when you are Minister of Interior, what have you done about it? You are talking. I have indicated the steps you have taken. You cannot reform any of the internal security institutions without implementing a security sector reform. And that was what I started during my time. We started with a security sector assessment report of the country. We validated it during my time. We created a document. We started working on strengthening and reforming, reforming and strengthening the institutions, reorientation, and of, of, of course, the equipment of the Gambia Police Force. And that was why I sought, through my effort as Minister of Interior, to bring into the funds of the ministry the sum of $90 million during my time to use in order to equip the Gambia Police Force and other supplied institutions. And I left these funds there. They were supposed to go towards providing the tools and the necessary wherewithal in order to empower our institutions so that they can continue to perform their duties. I am very proud in the main of the men and women in our uniform from the Gambia Police Force to the immigration to the prisons to the drug law enforcement people. And I'm not saying that things don't go wrong. Things have gone wrong in all of these institutions. But it is a process of growth. This is a process of development. And if in every development process, you are bound to make some mistakes. You are bound to go wrong. 
But when we do as a country, we learn from the lesson, we correct and we move on. We don't continue to move in the mistake. We don't continue to magnify the mistake. We move on with it. Mistakes have been done. Mistakes have been identified. Let us work together to correct them as a country and move on. We cannot continue to live in the past. The past is done. We have the ability to influence tomorrow. We have the ability to work on today. And that is what we should work on now. The security sector reform has failed. The security sector reform is in abyss. The, sector reform, the security sector reform is not given the priority it needs because politics has overtaken it. We must come back to the drawing board and focus on reforming the security sectors, not only the Gambia police force or those under the Ministry of Interior, but equally the National Intelligence Agency, which we now call the SIS. The armed forces, in terms of its personnel, in terms of its logistics, in terms of its resources and all that. This is what is necessary we must do today. So while we are today clamoring for change, the anti-crime must stay and should stay. And I'm urging the government to strengthen it, to reform it, to empower it with the tools necessary so that it can continue to protect Gambians across the country. But the anti-crime must also be duplicated in other parts of the country, not only in the, in the, in the western area, in the, in the metropolitan area. We need anti-crime in the upper river division. We need anti-crime in the CRR. We need it in NBR. We need it in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the West Coast. We need it in the LRR. We need every region needs an anti-crime, and every region needs a very robust anti-crime unit that will protect communities in all those regions in the country. And that's where we are going to attain public safety. And I believe with community policing, when you combine these two, the Gambia's trajectory towards a safe, secure, an orderly society can be achieved. This should be the concern of our, of, our, of our people. But where we have oppression within the Gambia police force, where we have violations of the law and order um, in any law enforcement institution, there should be clear consequences. The people who are affected should be isolated, they should be arrested, they should be prosecuted, and there should be a lesson to other law enforcement agencies that we will not allow the dehumanization of our people, we will not, we will not allow strict violations of human rights, and of course we will not allow the, uh, we will not allow the desecration of human dignity in our country. It is not acceptable in a democratic society that these sort of tendencies should continue to exist. And that is why today I think it is necessary that we should talk to our citizens so that we can look at where culpability lies. Where does the blame lies? Part of the blame lies with law enforcement. Part of the blame lies with the government that is not providing enough resources and that is not taking care of the needs and the demands of our law enforcement institutions, particularly domestic security. So I call on, I call on expanded funding, greater funding for the Gambia police force so that they have the vehicles they need. When you report crime, they're able to report so that they can continue to patrol our communities so that they can be present around our border villages and towns so that they'll be able to apprehend criminals, particularly violent criminals, and criminal gangs that are operating in different parts of our country. So that they'll be able to reduce the inflow of drugs in our country. So that they'll be able to handle all the kind of illegal uh, immigration, which is attendant crime, uh, crime rise in, in our country. We need greater training and reorientation for our law enforcement agencies. But most and most of all, we need more funding we need to put more money in security because security has no price, it has no value. If you want to know how expensive security is, as the saying goes, try insecurity. We look at countries, Liberia, we look at Sierra Leone, we look at Somalia, we look at Yemen, we look at Iraq, we look at Syria, and so many countries around the world. Try insecurity if you think security is expensive. That is why today I stand in solidarity with our law enforcement agencies, support and strengthen them. But I condemn those among them who are the crooks and the criminals, who abuse our public, who violate public trust. These are the few crooks among the police enforcement, police, uh, uh, police department, and other satellite institutions. That must be filtered out because criminals have no business being wearing our uniform. And those who brutalize and name our people, criminals, in police uniform, have no business serving the public. These are the people that must be weeded out, that must be taught what the law states. 
the overwhelming majority of our crime fighters are good men and women. They are fathers and mothers like us. They are brothers and sisters. They are older people's children like us. They belong to families and communities. They feel what, what we feel. They get hungry. They experience the difficulties of inflation and all the economic hardship. They live among us. And we must embrace them. Unless we equip them properly, then we have a problem. And this nation must be fair to those who are protecting us. So ladies and gentlemen, it is necessary that we hear all sides of the story. It is necessary that we must not continue to vilify every member who is in a police uniform today. And I can assure you as I speak, across this, the length and breadth of this country, people are, police, people are standing at police stations. People are reporting crime at police stations. That the police are running after criminals as we speak now. That people are being apprehended. That people are taken to court and some are on their way from court to, to remand stations. And all these are good police officers. Every day who are on the beat protecting our society, protecting our communities, protecting our businesses and our properties and our homes. And we must be thankful to them. And for those who continue to violate the law within the police force, the criminals within the police force, we must all identify them. We must all vilify them. We must all make sure that they are subject to the same law that every government is subjected to. So I call on the government of President Barrow to increase the funding of the police force. That all these vehicles that you are buying for your political party, these vehicles could have gone to a police force so that they can do increased uh, uh, community patrols. All these motorcycles, the thousands of motorcycles you are buying for your political party, giving them to people to run around with your politics for you. These, these, these vehicles and these motor bicycles could have been given to our police force so that they can patrol our borders and our drug law enforcement people. The buses that we see that have President Barrow's image on them from the NPP, these buses could have been given to the police force. They could have been given to drug law enforcement agencies. These monies that we have procured to advance the personal political ambition should have been a creative means of funding the police force and providing money and resources where the public needs it, and not the personal perpetuation of a political individual. This is what we need to look at. As long as we put politics first before public security, this is what you have. And it hurts me deeply, as a former Minister of Interior, that the foundation that I established at that ministry has been fully demolished. And I would not say it would be the responsibility of my successors. I would say it is a general negligence of the Gambia government that had led to that resources. Today, we must revise that negative trend and put security on the plate first because security is what gives rise to national development. It gives rise to national homogeneity. It gives rise to peace. It gives rise to economic growth. Without security, we, are not, we don't talk about agricultural productivity. There will be no cure, there will be no treatment, there will be, there will be no management of COVID if security is not there. And that's why we are all saying that the measures that we have put in place by the state of emergency, the SOPI, the COVID measures have not been fully implemented because the police are not able to implement. How can they implement? They don't have the tools. And that is why you go everywhere, there are public, public gatherings, people are not wearing masks as they ought to because the police don't have the capacity. They don't have the ability to enforce. Let us not blame the wrong culprits. They are not the culprits. It is the people who are in government who fail to give them the resources they need to implement the SOPI that has resulted in the failure of implementation of the emergency regulations. Because you gave me a task. You want me to perform a task. You fail to give me the resources and the tools to perform the task. How am I going to perform the task for you? That is the dilemma. We find national security and force, uh, national um, uh, internal security forces into. So the failure of national security is the failure of the Gambia government to provide adequate environment for security institutions to function to perform their statutory mandate. And unless we are able to do this, we are going to experience more crime, crime rates. We are going to experience more confrontation and more dissatisfaction, more insecurity of life or property at home in the streets. What we offer is the opposite of this. And today, once again, I am calling on the Gambia government to expedite the process of the security sector reform because that is where the solution lies. To commit themselves to the proper implementation of the security sector reform. For three and a half years, we have not been able to make much traction in this matter because there is no political will, there is no commitment towards that. So we must make a national decision 
Are we ready to go on with this tendency, with this trend? Or are we ready to change this? That is up to Gambians. You have a chance to do this, to reflect this in 2021. And nobody must fool you. The bags of rice and the few hundred dollars they are giving you is evidence of their insecurity. And when they sell your bath rice to you, you accept these small monies and these small bags of rice and these small bags of sugar. Again, you mortgage your right. I will be standing here again to narrate the same story and you'll be living in the same dire circumstances that we are living in today. So it is up to you, Gambians, whether you want to change this or you want to keep it. The power belongs to you. But you know the circumstances because we are all living this. But let us be fair to our security agencies. They cannot do more than their capacity. Nobody can run more than your speed. Nobody can run more than your speed. We cannot require law enforcement agencies to run faster than their speed unless we give them speed impetus. And that impetus is in the hands of the Gambia government and they're holding onto it and investing it into their own politics. This is the, this is the gospel truth and we Gambians must make a decision to change this narrative and this trajectory. I thank you all. We'll, we'll, take, we'll, take, we'll take a few questions. We'll take a few questions. A few questions only. We'll take a few questions. Uh, we'll take uh, five questions. That's it. Well, then, thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question. Gambia Talents? Yes. Uh, my name is Fatou Samba. I work for the Gambia Talents TV. Uh, my question is, um, right now, um, before, in those days, we have always seen uh, the former head of state, um, Yaya Jama, with due respect. I mean, as, much, as many people did, um, Yaya Jama will always come out, especially when certain things happen in the country. A lot of people are blaming not only the Gambia government, but even the Gambia leader, that is His Excellency, our President, Adam Bar. Um, right now, a lot of people are asking for the resignation of um, the current uh, minister, the current um, IGP. A lot of people are also saying that um, Gojimu should be served. I think uh, a lot of people are also saying that the President should just do what you did today by coming out to Gambia emphasize this, tell the leaders that, you know, uh, Gambia belongs to everybody and they should respect the general uh, public. I don't know, what is your own take when it comes to the president addressing Gambia so that people can know that, you know, the president is not responsible for what is going on. So many people are blaming him for not coming out to talk to the Gambian people. Well, there is something that is very famous called the box stops here. The government is the government of President Barrow. He's the president of the country. He's the one that was elected by Gambians. He has the mandate of the people directly. So he will take responsibility for all the good things that are happening in this government. He must equally take all the adverse effects of his government as well. Um, I can speak from my experience. When I was the Minister of Interior, I would often engage Gambians on things that are happening of this nature because it's my responsibility as security minister to deal with the situation. Today, the president decides uh, to act in a different style. Uh, I think that would be a question for the president to answer. But I believe that in periods of uncertainty, when the nation really needs assurance, when the nation is in need of a direction, when the nation is in need of a consolation, the president of the country should come out and address the public. That is the requirement of leadership. That, I understand, should be the requirement of leadership. When the nation needs assurance in a period like now, it is necessary that the government should come forward to speak. But up to now, not a single member of the government came forward to address the public. Not at the level of the ministry, not at the level of the presidency. It looks like there is no leadership in the country. But that is the decision of those who are in authority. I would have done differently. And that is why I felt as a leader of a political party, it is necessary for us to come and speak to the public, to clear the circumstances, but also to indicate what should be done. And we have fulfilled that mandate today. Now, whether the president will fulfill that mandate or not, is up to the, up to the, for the Gambians to come. Let us all look, let us all observe, to see what will happen. Thank you. Uh, 
ignore_time_segment_in_scoring Every decision maker needs facts. We need to make a proper decision in the absence of informed facts. So informed facts, you know, we need to know if you don't gather the facts, you don't investigate, and you get a conclusion. That's what we do process. That's what we do. 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 Where the police are, where the police are, there has to be an impartial investigation. And in this investigation, we need to know the facts. We need to know the facts. We need to know the facts. In other words, the principles of fair hearing must be applied. Those who are accused and the people investigating, plus the, the, the victim, all of their stories must be heard so that the facts can be assembled and a conclusion can be made. They propose a plan of action. Kurman, from Nekani, Fofulen told you can investigate the case. As investigation, then you can see the commission on book, continue to occupy the seat. Had na muna influence investigations more than you put call on administrative leave. So relevant government institutions you get investigate. Why man luma gena contact moye national human rights commission bitam you ngam ne bo kunfen te faru kunfen you ni tam you get investigate sen sen on sen on way. Te ya kar na ne you nyep war na you dal you nyep war na you har you mun be investigation bo bo je investigation bi lim tahual lo lo you nyep you muna tapal lo lo no no. Nous avons l'autre mot et conclusion. Avec recommandation. Recommandation, le mot n'est pas. Ce fait qu'il est consistant dans la loi, nous appliquons l'autre. So, in the meantime, man, I'm going to say that since we have an investigatory mechanism into effect by law enforcement, but also by an independent organization, the National Human Rights Commission, let us wait for the conclusion of the investigations and the recommendations for the next course of action. Man Bukuma wa because Bukuma preempt. At the same time, Bukuma influence investigation being hamne, mom them put into effect. The demand yah Gambians yep, you neka social media, you neka fenen, you yep, you har, you dal, you mon be investigation bije, you har be national human rights commission do he result ami ak recommendation. Subo ba you dia karlo nyinga hamne, you you send ligay, pour you dial send matuai you make sure ne recommendations you implement ko. So, to answer the question, the investigation is going to be put into effect. I am going to have an investigation. But I am going to say, who is going to resign? That is what I will wait for. I will wait for the investigation to complete. But I am going to say, I am going to conduct the investigation. I am going to expedite it. I am going to ask you, 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 Tak fumnya kan ini ni mula tu no anten, nyaw jeff tu yang hamne beri nafum ni kan ini silo enforcement bi. Kon nanyu gawalan tu, nyu jahal sen investigasi tu ni, nyu kira nawa askan bilan mau heu, depan gov me buah nyu ban step la nyu jel. Subuh oba mandi nawa ham lan nawa ratun tu. Why at the moment, di nawa preem investigasi bi, di nawa prejudice investigasi tu mungkin hamne is going on, and that will be irresponsible of me. Thank you. Yes. I think this is going to be the third question. So we'll have two more questions. I am Mohammed Kalbu, Mamus 
Ah, uh, Mamos. Yeah. Lama Wood. Okay. Uh, during your deliberation, you talked about <coughs> we, we, we move on from the fast. But looking at the, the security challenges that the country is facing at the moment, we have seen uh, what happened at Faraba, what happened at Faraba and Kunju, and also the, the protests at Pekama, and also the three years job now. And <coughs> we have seen Kuriji move presently in a week he has been accused of uh, stealing or, 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 or taking over 14 million dollars. And we also seen an allegation on him. And, and not long ago, we have seen a public supporting Khadija, giving their support for his sacrifice in executing her duties. And now that you are, you are, you are giving your support to, to the Gambia police force, I hope you know, that will give them uh, a hype to, to, to make sure that, you know, like we have seen a uh, video circulating Kojibu trying to defend himself on a PR reason, uh, showing what he, is, uh, he, he has been doing. And now that you are giving your support, you know, and the public is not uh, going for the police force, but they are going for certain individuals. And now that you are giving your support, hope that will not give them a, 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 a that will not uh, take another twist on the, on the, on the investigation. Uh, I do not think so, because uh, you, you must understand that I am, I am also a politician of the contemporary generation. So I am very much present in social media, on Twitter and on all these social media platforms. So I know exactly what is happening. I know what is the pulse of the public and the mood of the Gambians. But I know oftentimes the public can be wrong. The public must not always be right. And I have been in positions of authority where I know Sometimes you must, you must resist the grain. You must go against public sentiment in order to protect that public. In other words, I have always maintained it uh, in a legal maxim that I believe in, that is a breach of the law to uphold the law. In other words, sometimes people say you break the law in order to keep the law. You know? So what we are saying is that uh, I want the government public to focus on what is going wrong and not just on one wrong from one or two individuals and use it as a means to dehumanize or to demonize an entire institution. Because that is the tendency that is going on now. No. There, there are calls, let me finish, there are calls saying, there is a lot of calls. I have seen a lot of calls saying, scrap the anti-crime unit. That is very dangerous. Because you have a problem with the messenger, does not mean you should eliminate the message. In this case, Gorgon Boob is said to be a bad messenger. But the message that is being carried is a very good message. So we must not reject the message because we don't like the messenger. That is the issue. We may not like the way Gordon Boo operates, as social media had indicated. But that is not to say anti-crime should not do its work. What we should be calling for is reforming and restraining anti-crime and ensuring that we have officers who are officers of integrity, who will protect public right, but also ensure public safety. That is what we should be working on. But it would be dangerous for this general clamor that is leading to a con consensus that is scrap it completely. That is my position. Number two, because of the crime or because of the passive crime of one or two people at the anti-crime, the entire police force is seen as the enemy of the public. But these are not the enemies. You also have a few rotten potatoes that must be picked and thrown away. That is the issue. So I am here to put it within context that yes, we are angry at what happened at anti-crime, we are angry at some of the barbaric treatment that police force in this new government are doing against Gambians and other law enforcement agencies. That we are unhappy with the way our people are being treated. Yes, we are angry about all these things. But let us confront the cause. Let us confront the cause and not the effect. Right now, it appears there is a general antagonism against law enforcement. We are looking at, we are looking at, the, at the disease and not the, and not the cause of the disease. I am saying, let us look what caused the disease. Let us diagnose the disease before we look at the disease itself. In other words, let us look at the cause and not the effect. And some of the causes are itemized. That throughout this country, how many police stations have technology, do have police uh, computers? How many police stations have you gone to you found computers there? How many of them have electricity when there is no light? How many of them have vehicles when you report a case that they can go and patrol? How many of you have seen police in your neighborhood? How many of you in the country? How many of you have seen them patrolling across the borders? 
How many of you have seen them with a walkie-talkie communicating to each other? You saw Kadi Jaju. She was in the middle of a water pool, in the middle of a street, without proper shoes. Because the Gambia police force do not have rain clothes. They don't have rain, they don't have rain coats. They don't have boots that are uh, water sensitive. They don't have the tools and the gadgets. And if Kadi Jaju was not that type of extraordinary police officer, very enthusiastic, living in the, in the tools, she, has, she could easily go by the wayside, just like other police officers would, and they would be right. They would be right to get out of the rain because you are not going to, they don't have medical insurance. When they get sick, they don't have the money to cure themselves. She could suffer from pneumonia and anything. You and I do not care how they live in their families who suffer. We don't give the police any insurance. They don't have any medical cover. And it is raining. You expect them to go out and then do their job under the rain. They don't even have rain boots. They don't even have simple raincoat. How do we expect them to do their jobs? So look at some of these things. Yet we have crime every day on the rise. And we expect them to perform, to contain crime. We are not giving them the resources. We must be fair. We must speak truth to each other. I'm not condemning all the oppression. I'm not condemning the human rights abuses. But I'm not also condemning this blind allegation and this blind vilification. Because we as a country have failed to provide the resources. We have not put our, our government officials to account so that they can put our security first. But we are crazy. We are fighting behind them in their political parties, donning their political callers, party callers, and we are running blindly behind them. We are not even looking at ourselves. This is the situation of the country. So what I have indicated is not to embolden them towards committing more crimes against the public. It is to reflect the attention of the public towards the negligence of our own public security needs. That is what we need to understand. That is the difference. Because I made it clear that Gorgin Bouk must be investigated. That if he is found guilty, he must be prosecuted. And if found guilty, sent to prison. And many Gorgin Bouk in, in the police enforcement. Not just the police, everywhere else. But Gorgin Bouk is not the reason of anti-crime. Anti-crime exists not because of Gorgin Bouk. It exists because of the public. So if we have bad officers there, let us weed out the bad officers, strengthen the unit, empower it with resources and with good officers so that they can continue to do their job, but not to take the baby and the, and the, uh, the, baby and the bath water and throw them outside. That is not what I'm advocating. I hope you understand me. Yes. Absolutely. I think it is necessary for the Inspector General of Police to take a, an incisive look, a critical look into what is happening at anti-crime. And that is why I'm, I'm saying that we need to look at the rotten potatoes that are there, we remove them, eliminate them. But we need to strengthen the anti-crime, we need to reorient them so that they can continue to perform their duties. Several allegations have been made against them, and most of these allegations, I'm, not to my knowledge, have been properly investigated. Now we have the case of Ibrahim Hassani, which is a, which is a watershed. It affords us a one-time opportunity to look at everything holistically, everything that's wrong with the administration and management of anti-crime units. So this is an opportunity now for the police command to correct the ills within the anti-crime, reorganize it, reform it and reorganize it. But it is a very vital unit that should continue to protect the public. Only what is necessary, that we should put officers with integrity, officers who are properly trained, who understands fighting crime against the equilibrium of maintaining human rights, fundamental rights of the public. If we are able to achieve this too, then I think it is going to be a much needed department that will continue to serve the public security and safety aspirations of the Gambian people. But yes, we need to investigate all of the allegations there. And it has to be independent, it has to be exhaustive and conclusive. And the results, the recommendations, results must be made public to the Gambian people. So that those who are culpable, they are removed, they are prosecuted, and an example is set for the whole country to see. That I agree. But we must reform it, we must restructure it, and we must people with, with personnel who are full of integrity. But we must also resource them so that they have the tools necessary to protect the public. Thank you. One more question now. Last question, Buba. Ah, okay, well, second, second to last question. Second to last question. Now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, my question will of course focus on the issue of the security sector reform. Right. Um, like you said, you have been there before, and according to you, you in fact initiated the process. Uh, and we are all aware uh, where the process is now. Uh, a draft has been uh, drafted already, and uh, if I can remember, uh, there was a workshop to review the draft. Um, I don't know what is the state now, but um, looking at 
armies, uh, with police, security forces, not only police, even the military in the past. And <coughs> Maro himself um, um, been um, in the center of that, because that led to him being elected as the UDP candidate for the UDP in the 2016 election, because of the brutal event that happened after the death of Solo Sandin that led to the arrest of Osei and others, uh, eventually um, given the opportunity to lead the UDP, eventually to the coalition, then to the president. Um, will, should we consider um, the lack of security sector reform as the greatest um, weakness, or should we consider it as the greatest failure of the Barrow administration, given all the sequence that passed before he came to office, and even after that, with these experiences of good people uh, far and all the places. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, since the Barrow administration is still on, uh, there will be more failures. So it would be difficult to say it is the greatest failure because we still have up to 2021 and there'll be more failures along the line. So maybe there are bigger failures on the way. But I will say so far it is one of the main failures, one of the, uh, one of the failings of the administration. Because when we came in 2017, uh, the, one of the critical areas that needed urgent attention was the security sector. And that was why um, my ministry gave it number one priority. And that is the reason why when we set up a multidisciplinary task force at the office of the president, when we all met there, with all, the, all of the ministries in charge of security, and not only security, but economic uh, prosperity, um, I put up a very passionate case as to why the Minister of Interior should take the lead in the security sector reform. Then as minister, uh, I was able to get the consensus of the team, including those who were present, the European Union were there, United Nations, our development partners. And everybody agreed that the presentation that day by the Minister of Interior was the right one, and that I managed to give them space within the Minister of Interior to house the Security Sector Task Force, and also to conduct the study of the first ever national security assessment uh, of the Gambia, that looked at the entire security situation of the country, in every aspect, and created a report with the support of the United Nations at the time. Uh, and then we began to launch uh, security sector reform um, uh, as a policy. And this was also during my time as a Minister of Interior. It was launched uh, by the President, of course, with my input at Fajara, when the President was still living at Fajara. And when we had the first National Security Advisor also, who was then our ambassador in Turkey, we recall him, Momo Dubai, to become the first National Security Advisor. And then we began the process in the effect. But soon afterwards, I think, soon afterwards, uh, I was relieved of my responsibilities. And uh, the enthusiasm that informed the security sector reform as a policy and, and as an idea started to lose its tailwind. And we saw a nose drive uh, in the concentration on security sector reform. Uh, so we must understand that we have foreign forces in the, in the Gambia. We have ECOMIG here. And I know something about ECOMIG because I was involved in the negotiations from the beginning. Uh, we were not thinking that economics should be here after this time, because we were supposed to conduct a successful security sector reform that would see the departure of economic and the gradual assumption of national security duties by the armed forces and law enforcement agencies of the Gambia, so that the country can be fully sovereign with our own national institution of security, taking care of our national security. Uh, but unfortunately, it would be very unsafe today for foreign forces to live in the, the country because security sector has not been completed. So it is a major policy failure, a huge policy failure. One of the main planks of the uh, policy uh, considerations of our government, coalition government, and now the borough government, is the failure of the security sector. And if you talk to them, they will tell you security sector is succeeding. All they talk about is, you know, there is something called right sizing. Right sizing is going on. We have reduced the number here, reduced the number here. Security sector is not about reducing the number of people, past personnel in the armed forces or in the police. It's more than that. Police security sector is about attitude. You know, it's about a framework. It's about mindset. It's about institutions. It's about capacity. It's about laws. It's not just reducing number here and adding here. But that is all government will tell you. That we are right-sizing now. We have the problem of right-sizing. They are looking at only 5% of security sector reform, and 95% is eluding. And that is why we still have economic forces here, 
And I will insist they stay because it is necessary for the country to remain stable. Because we have not done what we should do as a country to strengthen, to streamline, to capacitate our security institutions. And failure to do that really squarely falls on the Gambia government. So yes, I'll agree with you. It is one of the monumental failures of the regime. And it is one of the areas that is given less emphasis. Because when I returned to state to, to, to president's office as special advisor to the president, the very first meeting that I had, the first meeting I had, this meeting included all the security chiefs together with our development partners, the European Union, the United Nations, the uh, foreign expatriates that are attached to uh, the security sector reform, they call them DECAF, and many more. We all sat down at the Office of the President, and it was informed at that meeting that I was going to handle with another person the completion of the security sector reform because not only Gambians, but our development partners were becoming very frustrated with the extremely slow pace of the security sector reform to a point that they were beginning to withdraw from the entire process. So in order to give it a new lease of life, they were informed that Honorable Maifadi is now going to be in charge of you know, re-engineering, putting more speed into the process. And that was how we were able to complete the drafting of the security, national security policy, had it validated, and get it launched by the president at Kairaba Beach Hotel. You have all witnessed that. And we all made speeches towards that. So, but that's not the end of it. You don't just make a policy, a document, and you make a speech, then you go and rest. You need to implement. It is the implementation where the details are, and it is where we are, in fact, very slow. Very slow. Very slow. And that's, that slow pace is a reflection of the commitment or lack of commitment. That is all it talks about. So indeed, we need to do something. And I urge the government to please come forward and do more with this security sector reform. It is inexcusable that three and a half years, the country is not able to see anything really positive about security sector reform. We need to be able to see, not just what is happening behind, behind the scenes. And that is where we are looking at, because we have seen that the security establishment have not changed much in terms of their modus operandi. So if we had a successful security sector reform, we would have seen tremendous, remarkable changes in the manner in which the management and the operation of our security outfits would have reflected. Thank you very much. Uh, Buba, last question. Yes, I will ask a question. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable. We're talking about um, the government where, um, where we are working. As yes. Minister, yes. Yes. It's like you have um, what experience there. Now, my question is, you talked about you know the reforms that you want to you wanted to do there. But unfortunately, um, you were stuck, and they were not continuing. They didn't go with that. So unfortunately, for that. So with your experience, you know, as the party leader of TMC, do you think the things that is Do I think President Barrow is competent to lead the country? What a very smart question. A simple question, a complicated one. Move away, left and blow neuros in the All right, uh, I think that's a loaded question. Uh, President Barrow was elected by Gambians. You elected him. And I was one of the lead political party stakeholders who also elected him. And not only that I have a part to blame if President Barrow has not done well. I have a part to benefit from if President Barrow did well. Because not only the GMC was the first political party to support his candidature, but GMC was among the parties that actually campaigned for him to get him the delegates he needed to be elected as a coalition flag bearer. So I will admit that I played a part, and I'm not going to say I will not take part of the blame for getting President Barrow to lead the Gambia. Whatever it is, Barrow was our Barrow that we put him forward, and his mistakes are some of the mistakes that we must take as a corporate mistake. So today, we must face that reality. Is he competent? Now, whether President Barrow is competent, that is for Gambians to say. Because, let, let me finish, I'm just one individual. I'm one individual. I am one individual. President Barrow was placed was voted for by Gambians, and it is Gambians who will pass a verdict on him, whether he was competent or not competent. Based but based on my view, based on my view, 
I think President Barrow could have done better, more than he did. I think President Barrow, it, it is difficult to give a yes or no answer. President Barrow has done well in some other areas. He's done very bad in other areas. I think he made some very bad decisions in many areas. I think he's doing well in terms of infrastructure. He's doing well in, in building infrastructure in Upper River, in other parts of the country. In terms of governance, he has done bad. President Barrow's style of governance is not good at all. I would not consider President Barrow a good president in terms of governance. But I would say he has done very well in terms of infrastructure. He's done very well in terms of building infrastructure. He's done very well in terms of being tolerant. Because today, we all know President Barrow is vilified everywhere. The kind of statements that are uttered against him, the kind of things that are said about President Barrow and his government, well, it requires, it takes a, a person with great courage and great patience to accept these things without reacting. You know? So in that sense, I think he's a very tolerant leader. That is a very good character of him. But in terms of governance, I would say the state of the Gambia is in a very bad shape. I think that answers your question. We live in a day and age where technology is creating a world without borders, filled with unlimited potential to improve the lives of the people around us. InnovaRex Global Health ushers in a new way of leveling the playing field with increased access to quality healthcare services delivered at your doorstep. Our qualified professionals are equipped with state-of-the-art point-of-care testing technology to conduct tests such as kidney function, liver function, electrolyte tests, body composition, hemoglobin, A1C, and many more services with the highest efficiency in delivering results. The addition to our flagship Wellness on Wheels, more fondly known as WOW Delivery Service, brings the entire clinical experience full circle. IGH has remained committed to creating the future of healthcare delivery. Gone are the days of sending loved ones outside the country for basic medical services. Innovarex Global Health offers a new peace of mind and takes pride in delivering the quality of care we all deserve. Are you thinking of owning your dream homes? EJ Investment is here for you. Secure our quality bungalows with two, three or four bedrooms or our story building three or four to five bedrooms at very affordable prices with flexible payment plans at our Sanyang Sea View Estate where you can enjoy the cool breeze with modern infrastructure such as the roads, covered drainage system, modern electrification with street lights, gated entrance with security posts and social amenities such as gas station, shopping mall, medical clinic, park, school, children daycare and a lot more. Our dedicated team of professionals will keep the estate clean at all times, provide security and patrol team within the estate premises, install latest technologies such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, home network installation, solar panel and power backup system. Also, check out for our additional home facilities and interior design service, such as premium tiling, wall plaster, home landscape, fingerprint home lock, and a lot more. Visit our office at Senegambia Kololi Highway and get a free site visit tour or contact us on 4464-838. WhatsApp us on 3259-220. Or you can visit our Facebook page or Instagram on EJ Investments. EJ Investments, we are first in properties.